Sadlock, 11 News Tonight. This is the CBS Evening News. Bob Schieffer reporting. Good evening. The Soviet Union and China will hold their first summit meeting in 30 years. That was the announcement today from Soviet officials in Beijing. The announcement coming just three weeks before President Bush's planned visit to China. John Cheyen has our report. China's senior leader, Deng Xiaoping, and Soviet Foreign Minister, Edward Shevardnadze, put aside 30 years of antagonism. And according to Shevardnadze, agreed to a meeting between Deng and Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev in mid-May. The Chinese and Soviets agreed to begin negotiating a reduction of military forces on their border. The feud is over, said the Soviets. It's time to close the page on the past and open up the chapter of the future. Beginning with the first Sino-Soviet summit since 1959, when the two countries had a bitter falling out over ideology. The main objective of that summit meeting is to establish a complete normalization of relations between the Soviet Union and the Chinese People's Republic. Despite the official reconciliation, many Chinese remain skeptical. Some of the government's own foreign policy experts urge caution because of the Soviet Union's long history of dominating its friends and promoting regional conflicts between neighbors. China has to continue to maintain vigilance on against the Soviet international behavior. Despite Shevardnadze's obvious pleasure at the outcome of the meeting, the Chinese have already made it clear that they will not restore their former military and political relationship with the Soviet Union. John Shayan, CBS News, Beijing. Shevardnadze arrived tonight in Pakistan for talks on Afghanistan, as the Kremlin's top Afghanistan negotiator said that the Soviet pullout will be com uh, completed in four days. That is a week ahead of schedule. But Soviet weapons were still rolling into Kabul today, as Barry Peterson reports. A last-minute resupply of Kabul continued this huge convoy arriving from the Soviet Union coming down the Salang Highway. Its deadly cargo, rockets that can be fired from multiple launchers on the back of trucks. Only a part of the Soviet-stocked arsenal the Mujahideen will face if they attack this city. And no one can guarantee that the Salang Highway, littered with the debris of weeks of fighting, will remain open. There is no panic in the city, not yet, but there is plenty of apprehension. People can point to surrounding mountains and name the Mujahideen guerrilla bands believed to be hiding up there, waiting for the last Soviet troops to leave. It is very dangerous. And all of the people, Afghan people, are afraid from it. It is very dangerous for all of us. Yeah. The outward signs point to a military siege, but both the Soviets and the Afghan government they support keep calling for a political settlement. Talk with hope about it, even at this late hour. President Najibullah repeated that theme, saying he would not try to hold what he called a monopoly position on power, that he'd be willing to help form a coalition government, that he and the Soviets remain optimistic this bloody battle for power can be solved over a conference table instead of over the barrel of a gun. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Kabul. In Paraguay, diplomats today said that at least 300 people were killed in Thursday's bloody military coup. The general who took charge has promised to return to democracy, but already there are reports that he is a longtime international drug dealer. Frederick Tice says the story from the Paraguayan capital. Some Paraguayans went to the streets to cheer the soldiers who had just overthrown General Alfredo Strussner. They also went to take a look at the damage caused by heavy firefights that claimed hundreds of lives on Thursday night. It looked as if a hurricane had hit Asuncion. Trees were torn up and telephone poles were down. The overthrow of the longest dictatorship in Latin American history meant the end of an era. We have been waiting for 34 years for this, said this woman. We feel free now, and we're looking forward to democracy. But not everyone is so sure. While General Andres Rodriguez was given a generally warm response following his swearing in by the crowd outside the presidential palace, others seem to be merely curious, perhaps skeptical, upon hearing a tough general talking about democracy. The problem will be if General Rodriguez insists on maintaining power uh, and using democracy as just a facade for his power. The irony is that 
Rodriguez was, until recently, one of Stroessner's strongest supporters. But there are widespread suspicions that Rodriguez made much of his money from drug trafficking. I don't have any particular reason to believe that given General Rodriguez's record that he's going to be anxious to go after drug dealers. Still, there is hope here. Members of the Paraguayan media, for example, say they look forward to a lifting of restrictions on the press. Rumors that Strussner's departure was imminent brought the press out to General Alfredo Strussner International Airport this afternoon. It was another sign that an era had ended and a sign that Strossner's mark will remain for a long time to come. Frederick Tice, CBS News, Asuncion. Five different Beirut publications said today that some Western hostages in Lebanon will be freed soon. One magazine said two of the nine American hostages would be released. None of them gave the names or details. Well, still ahead on the CBS Evening News, what on earth will become of Star Wars in the post-Reagan era? And later, Charles Osgood with the issue politicians try hardest to duck. It's nice to be noticed for what you wear and how you look. And if you wear dentures, it's nice to know Effordent freshens up dentures and cleans away stains so well. With Effordent, all they'll notice is you. Now, from any phone in America, you can get 30 minutes of 100% fiber optic long distance free. Just pick up a phone, call US Sprint now, and talk with the best free. Red Lobster presents the Lobster and Shrimp Combination Celebration. Two celebrated tastes, lobster and shrimp together. It's tender grilled shrimp, it's luscious rock lobster, langostinos that sizzle, shrimp scampi, and more. A celebration of six lobster and shrimp platters starting at just $7.95. Kids shrimp dinner, $1.95. Join the Lobster and Shrimp Combination Celebration at Red Lobster now. And get a half pound of snow crab legs for just $3.95 with any entree. You know, you don't always have to eat dates, raisins, and walnuts to get high fiber. Mm -hmm. Why don't mm -hmm. you try a different flavor of fruit and fiber? No, no. This is delicious. You've got chewy dates, plump raisins, and crispy walnuts. Why don't you just taste this? All right. Come in. I'll get it. Yeah. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Mmm. Mm. That's delicious, too. Here. You have some of mine. Go on. No? Try something new. Try something new. Go on, go on, go on. Mm. Post fruit and fiber cereal with dates, raisins, and walnuts. Tastes so good, you forget the fiber. Winter hit the continental United States with a vengeance today from west to east and as far south as the Gulf Coast. If it wasn't snowing, it was bone-chilling cold, and in some cases, it was both. Bob McNamara has our report. In Denver, 20 and 30 vehicle pileups shut down interstate highways after a night of snow and bitter cold. We were just like a bunch of little ping-pong balls just bouncing around on the interstate. I just hung on. What else could you could do? You just hang on hoping you didn't get hurt. At Denver's snarl-prone airport, snow and low visibility slowed air traffic by 70% for a time. Scores of flights were canceled or put on long delays. At Vail, Colorado, so much snow fell overnight that today's World Alpine Ski Championships were canceled. I haven't seen this much snow here in 24 hours and three or four years. From a bus accident near Grand Junction, Colorado, where several passengers suffered serious injuries, to Butte, Montana, where it was 44 below today, Winter's big chill continued plaguing much of the mid and far west. In California, Interstate 50 was shut down during the night by an avalanche, while sub-freezing temperatures in Portland had sea scouts hacking the ice from boats to prevent them from sinking under the added weight. We saved him in 1983 and we'll save him in 1989. Always with the ice comes fire. In Milwaukee last night, a five-alarm blaze gutted three businesses and warehouses and sub-zero temperatures prevented firemen from controlling the blaze for more than four hours. Today in Tacoma, fires suspected of being cold-related killed a three-year-old and injured seven others. Still, despite single-digit temperatures in St. Louis, more than a thousand pro-choice and anti-abortion demonstrators marched in city streets. Forecasters say there's little relief soon from the record low readings and dangerous wind chills and the only good news in Montana is highs tomorrow could climb to zero. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Denver. 
Farm country, of course, good news would be rain or snow. There hasn't been much of either lately, though, and the winter wheat crop is now in serious trouble. James Hattori has that. In the bone-dry wheat fields of Kansas, the disastrous drought of 1988 isn't over yet. Since last October, rainfall here is off by two-thirds. Farmers fear their summer harvest will be off, too. If we get a little below normal moisture and this continues on uh, a half a crop, we'd be fortunate to have that. Bitter cold is adding to Armstrong's worries. Last month's warm weather turned a lot of wheat green. Now, without a protective blanket of snow, the crop could easily freeze to death. When we have the sub-zero weather like we're having now, why, uh, it can winter kill very easily. The winter drought threatens farmers in the northern plains, parts of the Midwest, and Texas. But agricultural officials say there's still time to avert a disaster. The, the critical period for wheat will be in, in, in coming weeks in terms of the moisture. The drought of 89 also threatens the food supply for third world countries. At a time when grain consumption is greater than production, reserves are dropping, prices are rising. So a lot of people in third world countries are already spending 70 or 80 percent of their income on food. If the price of food doubles or triples, then their, their consumption drops below the survival level. For American farmers, it's a question of economic survival. Oh, I think there's a lot of worry and a lot of concern, and, but it's a problem that you can't do, you know, whether you can't do anything about it, and so, so you just uh, hope and pray that it'll get a little bit better, you know. The word may be getting through. Forecasters say the drought-stricken areas will receive above normal precipitation over the next 90 days. James Hattori, CBS News, Atchison County, Kansas. The plant closing law passed by Congress last year went into effect today. Large companies now must give workers 60 days notice of any plant shutdown or mass layoff. The North Carolina company is serving notice that it may have to close down because it can't meet the clean water standards of the state next door. Christine Negroni now with that. Starting in North Carolina, the Pigeon River ends 70 miles later in Tennessee. Along the way, it becomes one company's industrial sewer and a symbol of how much a clean environment can cost. The Champion Paper Mill employs 2,000 people in Canton, North Carolina. It uses the Pigeon River to discharge coffee-colored waste laced with dioxin. It looks bad. It smells bad. Uh, so it's, it's not a good situation at all. Downstream is Tennessee, with pollution standards so tough, Champion says it will have to shut down because it cannot comply. There's no technology that exists today that would allow us to continue to operate this mill and meet that standard. The threat to close scares the people of Canton, who have depended on Champion for 80 years. Looks like it's just going to be a ghost town. And I thought I was going to be able to retire from here just like my granddad did and have a good life. And that's just what we thought would happen. We never thought we would see it come to a close. The prospect of losing Western North Carolina's largest employer angers people across the state. Tennessee, our neighbor, has seriously injured North Carolina. And for no good reason. Tennessee's governor believes he has a very good reason. I have concern for people losing their jobs, but we've got to have clean water and clean air in this country, and we've got to have the Pigeon River cleaned up in East Tennessee. Pollution on the Pigeon River has been an issue for so long, residents on both sides of the state line are beginning to wonder if they can ever have both a strong economy and a healthy environment. Christine Negroni, CBS News, Newport, Tennessee. Making a freeze-dried taster's choice. Start with superior fresh brewed coffee, then freeze it. Freeze-dry is the best way to lock in the fresh brewed taste and aroma. That's why the choice for taste is taster's choice. These days, Americans are eating foods that are low in cholesterol. Or are they? Cooked in butter, even these aren't as cholesterol-free as they could be. That's why there's Butter Flavor Pam Cooking Spray. It has a buttery flavor, yet adds no cholesterol. So you can pick foods that are low in cholesterol and keep them that way. Pam, because how you cook is as important as what you cook. All your life, you've taken care of everyone else. But now... It's my turn to see what I can see. I hope you'll 
understand this time's just for me with the get up and go passport from continental travel to your choice of over a hundred domestic destinations for one low annual fee and for an additional fee europe hawaii the caribbean and south america Her doctor said it's heartburn. Heartburn and high blood pressure. He wants him to cut out salt. For heartburn, take sodium-free Riopan Plus 2. It starts neutralizing acid in 10 seconds. Feeling better, Dad? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Riopan Plus 2. Sodium-free. Works fast. President Bush called his top advisors to the presidential retreat in Maryland today to work on the problem no one seems to have an answer for, the problem of the savings and loan industry. Linda Tyra has our report. At the presidential retreat at Camp David, there was no escape from the savings and loan crisis. Today, President Bush called in some of his top advisors to discuss the Treasury Department's latest bailout proposals. A White House spokesman said the president received options but made no decisions. Taking part in the meeting were Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady, Budget Director Richard Darman, and White House Chief of Staff John Sununu. They were later joined by Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. One proposal thought to be under discussion is to have banks and SNLs pick up most of the bailout tab by paying higher deposit insurance premiums. The industry, already saddled with 350 insolvent thrifts, says those expenses would make a bad situation worse for the industry, even though consumers would be spared. This will impose additional costs on, an in on the industry at a time when it's going to be very, very hard for them to absorb those costs but it's probably uh, unlikely that it would be significantly passed on to the consumer. Yeah, the markets are just too competitive. President Bush, who has tried to quell the outcry against another proposal in which depositors would bear the SNL bailout costs, has warned any approach will not be popular. And experts say the longer he waits, the bigger the price tag. The sooner we can do the bailout, the lower the cost to taxpayers in the future. So we need to take those hits right up front. One veteran government watcher says it's no surprise Mr. Bush hasn't come up with rapid solutions. Probably we're looking at a catch-your-breath presidency, a consolidationist presidency. Every presidency doesn't necessarily come on like gangbusters. A spokesman says Mr. Bush will come up with an SNL package early next week before he delivers his budget to Congress on Thursday. With billions needed for the bailout, the challenge for the president is how to find the money without resorting to new taxes. Linda Tyra, CBS News, the White House. Another big part of official Washington also headed for the hills this weekend. It was supposed to be a little vacation, but one issue that's been dogging them all week followed them all the way to West Virginia. And Deborah Potter has that report. House Democrats hold their annual retreat at this luxury resort to get away from it all and focus on the future. But this year, the elegant setting put an ironic twist on the one issue the Democrats didn't want to dwell on the congressional pay raise due to take effect next week. Coming to Greenbrier away from the frenetic and tedious disputations and controversial issues, I think it's a great idea when it works. I hope... Um, In fact, there was no escaping the, the pay issue. Set. It hung over the Democrats all the way here, and only a few members were willing to publicly defend the proposed 50% hike. In my view, if the country is not getting congressmen that are worth at least $135,000, then the country is being cheated. It's never a good issue to have out there because uh, congressional pay is not uh, popular and people see us voting for a pay increase and we can't deal with the deficits. Jim right, you have no pride. All you do is run and hide. Unpopular indeed. Even in this remote setting, a tiny band of pay raise opponents turned out to protest the plan. House Speaker Jim Wright dodged all questions about the raise. He's already said he'll try to cut it back to 30% in an effort to quell the public's anger. But other Democrats say the outcry probably won't die. The fact of the matter is, pay raises being voted by elected officials are controversial no matter how big it is, how small it is. And no matter what happens in the House, there's no guarantee the Senate will go along. Opponents there say they'll keep fighting to repeal any raise, which means the issue won't be settled anytime soon. Deborah Potter, CBS News, with the Democrats in West Virginia. Controversial Bush cabinet nominee Lewis Sullivan said today that to avoid the appearance of conflict of interest, he'll take an unpaid leave of absence from the Atlanta medical school he heads. 
Sullivan had at first asked if he could continue being paid by Morehouse College while he served as Health and Human Services Secretary. White House Counsel and Chief Ethics Advisor C. Boyden Gray says that he will continue to serve as chairman of his family's communications company. But he told the Washington Post today that in order to comply with the president's ethics guidelines, he will no longer accept a fee from the corporation, as he now concedes he has during past government service. Ow! I feel good! If you want to control your sodium, cholesterol, and fat intake, delicious Le Menu Lifestyle lets you feel... On July 26, 1983, the Gaynor family had a heart attack. When John had his heart attack, really happened to all of us, our whole family changed. One of those changes is our diet. Now it's low in saturated fats and cholesterol. Fleischmann's is a part of that diet. It has zero cholesterol, and another thing, it tastes terrific. I mean, I want to keep him healthy, but I want to keep him happy, too. Fleischmann's. It does your heart good. If I were a kind, warm, generous person, I'd tell all my friends about this famous beauty treatment, how it feels so rich yet is really greaseless, how it holds moisture in my skin. And because it's like the fluids my skin has lost, it sinks right in, softening, smoothing. So I look younger. But just this once, I'm going to be small, mean, and selfish, and not tell. Why grow old gracefully? Fight it with oil of Olay. I'm not going to take it anymore. Sure, Metamucil works, but it's gritty. I'm not going to take it anymore. No more. Take low-calorie Citrusel regular. Citrusel isn't gritty, and it really works. The Star Wars missile defense, where does it go from here? From our Washington notebook tonight, a look at what President Reagan once envisions as a sort of electronic astrodome over the country. A shield of defensive missiles and laser weapons that would guarantee that no enemy missile would ever hit U.S. soil. That was the president's vision five years ago, but it is the vision of almost no one else anymore. And as we learned this week, that is the problem facing the new administration. Stand by the judge. Charging. Three, two, two one. Here we are five years later. We've uh, got 15 or 20 billion dollars of contracts out. There are thousands of contractors, tens of thousands of scientists and engineers working on the program. And despite the fact that no one believes in President Reagan's original vision of Star Wars as a perfect defense, the program continues. If Star Wars, the shield around the Earth to destroy enemy missiles, was the child of Ronald Reagan, its nurturing and upbringing has been left in the hands of George Bush. It will cost billions before it reaches maturity, and already it looks like it will grow into a different kind of adult under the new administration. Like his ad principal advisors, George Bush thinks the Astrodome is not feasible and is looking for uh, uh, some purpose for SDI, which is less demanding. Changes in the wind were hinted at by Mr. Bush's designate for defense secretary. I don't believe we, that we can devise uh, an umbrella that can protect the entire American population from nuclear incineration. The new president hasn't said yet what he will do with the Star Wars program, but during the campaign he made it clear he would provide for its upkeep. I will go forward with SDI. I will research it vigorously, decide the architecture of the system, and when it is ready, I will deploy it. Parts of the futuristic system will undergo major tests in the next few months. A satellite launched by a Delta rocket will track unarmed missiles launched from Earth. A huge sensor mounted on this 767 aircraft will track missiles falling into the Pacific Ocean. And an interceptor rocket, which in the future will smash incoming warheads, will be test fired in New Mexico. Uh, I sense this informed pragmatism, I would call it, about the program is pretty much the view that the senior Bush offici officials have been expressing. So I'm optimistic. Under George Bush, Star Wars will turn away from the dream of an all-powerful shield to a system that will destroy only a limited number of missiles that might be launched by mistake or by terrorists. 
or a system that would protect the missile silos, but not the cities. SDI still stays, it's still got the same name, but it's got a little different focus, a little different cost, a little different kind of a program. And we are told a little less money to work with. Sources say the Bush administration early next week will recommend a substantial cut in what the Reagan team wanted for Star Wars research. Feel your oats. Host. Oats, oats. Feel your oats. Host. Oats, oats. With new post oat flakes. Zero cholesterol. Whole grain oats with oat brand nutrition. And delicious with a taste of golden toasted whole grain oats. No one packs nutrition and taste into an oat flake like post. Feel your oats. Post. Oats, oats. With new post oat flakes. Feel your oats. Who would have figured it? I grow up in the city and end up testing products for the farm. Like this one from Dow. We study its effects in the classroom and check the results in the field. It yields more food, more profits for family farmers, and greater groundwater protection. But Dow gave me a grant to find out how to make it work even better. You know, I like being a city kid working in a cornfield. When constipation plus hemorrhoids twist you in knots, try Haley's M.O., the gentle laxative plus a soothing ingredient, so it lubricates for easier relief. Haley's M.O., the laxative even gentle enough for hemorrhoid sufferers. In a place like this, what you bring with you is critical. When a thousand doctors were asked which one of these medicines they'd want along, the clear choice was Bayer. I chose Bayer. Shouldn't you? Bayer, the wonder drug that works wonders. It is not too much to say that the current debate in Washington over taxes has several foul aspects, and the foul of choice appears to be the duck. Charles Osgood reports. Of all ornithological species, perhaps the most easily identifiable is the duck. That characteristic waddle, that unmistakable quack. In other words, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. On the wings of metaphor, the duck flew quickly to the top last week. I would refer you to Richard Darman. He's the guy that defined that very well up there with the duck test on the hill. Recently, a whole flock of ducks has been flapping around the Capitol. <clears throat> if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Paradoxically, uh, this is a paradox, by the way. These days, if it walks and talks like a vice president, it's a quail. So I think that our motto must be, no duck hunting this year. Duck seldom fools man, although occasionally man is unkind enough to fool duck. Man has been known to imitate the duck's walk and haircut. Many a young man has been deducted when inducted. Why a duck, you wonder? That is a good question. Well, I'm sorry the matter ever came up. All I know is that it's a buyer duck. Hello, all right. I catch on to why a horse, so why a chicken, why this, why that. I don't catch on to why a dog. What Congress and the administration might keep in mind is... The duck test is, if it quacks, it's a tax. And if it's a tax, it's a dead duck. Charles Osgood, CBS News. And that's the news. Bill Plant will be here tomorrow, later tonight on West 57th, the story of a surgeon convicted in the death of patients and still practicing. I'm Bob Schieffer, CBS News in New York. in Motown, the Bulls battle the Pistons tomorrow. This is CBS.